Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar from the University of Michigan's Office of Research Research Development Team. My name is Jesse Johnston and I'll be presenting the webinar this afternoon. This webinar is on the theme of strategies for federal humanities and arts funding. We originally recorded the webinar on August 12th and I'm re-recording it just after that original broadcast to correct some audio problems that we had in the initial presentation. My role at the university is as Senior Research Development Officer. Uh, to this role, I'm bringing a number of years of experience working in the federal sector with arts and humanities grants. I've worked for about the last decade in various federal cultural agencies, including the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, or the NEH. At the NEH, I served for five years as a program officer in preservation and access, and I'll try to share some of my perspectives on the processes and procedures of these agencies with you today so that you can use this insight to craft and plan and strategize about applications for federal grants. In addition to that experience, I have a PhD in musicology from the University of Michigan, and I'm really happy to be able to join that experience in research in the humanities with this experience in arts and humanities grants management, which I hope will be of use to you today. For the most part, I will skip over this slide since we are rebroadcasting, re-recording this broadcast. However, I will point out that in the lower left-hand corner of all of these slides, you will see a short link that will take you to these slides. Should you like to download them, follow any of the links that are included, or find the citations that I have included in the slide notes, I would welcome you to do so. Additionally, I'm making these slides available under a Creative Commons license, and you are welcome to download them and use the information in these or reuse it in other presentations, should you like to do so. If you do that, please give credit where credit's due, as I try to throughout the notes and slides to show where these ideas and great insights come from. So let's get started. In the webinar today, I plan to cover, cover a number of things but most of the content will be dedicated to a discussion of programs at the National Endowment for the Humanities, or the NEH, and the National Endowment for the Arts, or the NEA. In addition, I'll talk about some specific strategies for crafting and planning applications to these agencies. And I will also talk about some specific programs that you may want to think about or find out more for applications in your own work. Hopefully, you'll be able to use all of these strategies as a sort of roadmap to strategize and figure out how to get from here to there. Before we get started, let me just say a word about funding disparities in federal grants. I don't want to belabor this point because I would encourage you not to compare funding in the sciences and medicine with that in the arts and humanities. However, because we're presenting this webinar from the Office of Research, and we are presenting and serving the entire research community at a major research university, it is important to understand that there is a disparity in funding in different areas. At the research university in particular, this has sometimes contributed to a lower familiarity with grants that are coming out of a different financial situation than science and medicine. In short, there is less money out there that's dedicated to specifically arts and humanities research. If you look at this chart on the left, you can see the annual expenditures on research grants from some of the major funders at the federal level for the fiscal year 2018. You can see here that approximately $26 billion is given out on average by the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, and another $7.5 billion comes from the NSF. Meanwhile, the NEH and the NEA together don't even comprise a small percentage of those large amounts. So we're talking about a lot of different resource allocations here. And moreover, if you look at the chart on the right, you can see the no average number of awards, awards given by each of these agencies. 47,000 uh, grants from the NIH in the area of research and related activities. Meanwhile, 
just above 3,000 annually from the NEH and the NEA combined. What does this mean for your strategy in applying? The bottom line is that there's not a lot of pie out there for everyone to get a piece of. And so either you're going to get smaller bits or you may end up not getting a piece of the financial pie at all. That is to say, the cultural agencies award many grants, but there are many that, because of the funding disparities, are not able to be funded in a given year. In addition, as far as strategy is concerned, you may want to think of these grants as things that you can use to enhance a project. But the awards are rarer and difficult to get, and in many cases, they are as valuable for the imprimatur, which is to say, the stamp of approval from a national level funding agency as they are for the actual research funds received. This webinar is presented as part of a larger series which focuses on grantsmanship, and I would describe grantsmanship as the general skills and understanding of the grant process, which you can use to craft more competitive applications and put together better applications to bring to funders. There are many similarities of process across federal grants, but just to refer to the previous slide that I showed, just as there is a disparity in funding between the different funding agencies, there are specific differences in process between applying for grants at the NEH and the NEA and the science and medicine agencies. Specifically, I am hoping to explain to you in this presentation some strategies around talking about the significance of your work and how to effectively communicate that within the rhetorical space of a grant application. As a program officer, I did a lot of work out in the field talking with potential applicants in various disciplines across the humanities. I did occasionally hear, particularly from researchers who worked in the sciences and in the arts, that they found the NEH and NEA a little bit hard to approach in some cases because they felt like it was a little too much of a let every flower grow kind of situation. To them, the peer review process in the sciences was much more specific and domain based. It's important to realize, however, that all the applications to whatever agency are going to be subject to certain interpretations. And this may be more or more true for arts and humanities grants. And I just want to put that out there so everyone's aware of it, and also so that you are aware that there are certain subjective and aesthetic interpretations that are going to come into the grant review process. In fact, the Supreme Court, in its 1998 decisions that uh, were in reference to complaints about the NEA's grant review process, upheld this idea and said that there would be a significant amount of subjectivity an in review of projects. And they validated that the broad rubrics that the NEA continues to use, which are artistic excellence and artistic merit, were valid. Furthermore, the Congress has the ability to set spending priorities, and those are enacted by the executive branch in funding decisions. Furthermore, the ruling codified the policy that while review panels constituted with attention to diversity were appropriate mechanisms, that they are balanced as well by the administrative priorities that are vested in the administration and in the chairperson of each endowment. I'll describe more how this plays out in the specific review processes of each agency as we go along. But it's important to keep in mind throughout that while these agencies support, in a broad sense, the arts and humanities across the country, they may or may not align with your individual research plans in every project. I'd also just like to underline the point that grantsmanship skills are always helpful to anyone thinking about applying for a grant, whether it's to a federal funder or to other funders. But it's really critical that people like me who are working on uh, supporting the research enterprise across the university, as well as the researchers, have this information. So I do want to put out there that it's really important to have this information in the hands of the PIs and potential applicants, particularly in a situation where the funding is 
particularly scarce and difficult to get, it's critical to have subject matter experts and topical and methods uh, experts involved in every stage of the application from the overall narrative and planning the sort of intellectual framework around a project to planning the day-to-day -day activities and the budget. Throughout the process, it's always the most helpful to make sure that we all have the information, but in this situation, it's doubly critical that everyone understands the process. Going back to the levels of familiarity with grant culture or grant applications, I want to put out there that there's a lot of reasons you might be thinking about applying for a grant. You know, people are often thinking, hmm, I have a research question, I have this project that I want to do, maybe I could get a grant. That is the place you want to start, with a good idea and a strong basis in your discipline. However, what I want to encourage you to do throughout this presentation is to think about organizing these ideas into a product. So you might be thinking, I want to have more time for writing. Perhaps getting a grant could allow me to pull back from some teaching duties to do that. Doing more writing isn't necessarily the activity that a funder will want to fund. Think about what you would produce should you receive an award, the specific product. So in that case, it could be something like, I want to finish the book. Or if you want to do more research activities like going to more archives, visiting some museum collections, analyzing or gathering new data, what are those there to support? Possibly, again, it could be to finish the book, a series of articles, or another work. Um, perhaps you do the kind of work that might support a sort of infrastructural project, by which I mean the general resources that serve people across a discipline. So in that case, perhaps your work will contribute to creating a stronger library or museum collection, to the creation of a dictionary that provides basic information, authoritative information about a language, or a reference resource like an encyclopedia. Um, if you are in the later stages of work, you might already know that you're working on a project that creates a scholarly annotation about a, pro uh, about a work or a critical edition. Perhaps you're working on a translation or a digital collection. These are all the things that the funders are going to be thinking about. If you're working in the arts, um, perhaps you want to do a performance or perhaps you want to research what the impact or methods around a research, a particular artistic activity are, think about directing those into some kind of product. Maybe you want to produce a report on how the arts benefit a community's economy, or perhaps you are looking at presenting a performance as part of a festival. Any of these things are ways of thinking about how you take those activities, which are the things that you do as a researcher or a scholar, and turning those into the products that you want to be focusing on for your grant application. In the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on a few specific programs and the two cultural agencies that I mentioned at the beginning. While planning this presentation, I had initially thought this would be a series of case studies, um, but instead of structuring it so regularly, I want to just point, do this as a, a section and point out some of the themes that I see going throughout. I hope that through this body of the presentation, you will take away an understanding of the two agencies and their missions and how you can use that knowledge to strategize about positioning your application and research. I hope that you take away an understanding of at least one key program that you might be interested in and think about how you could fit your work into projects that fit inside the funding streams that these agencies offer. And finally, hopefully you will have a good understanding of who reads applications and why that is important, the audience that you will be speaking to, which in these cases is not the general public but a panel of reviewers who will make a recommendation about whether your project will receive funding or not. In the previous installments of this webinar, we have talked about this as the legwork, understanding who we are dealing with and what we are dealing with. So uh, throughout, this is going to be a section of the presentation that provides you with some background on these key cultural agencies. And the goals of this section are to balance uh, sort of Cliff Notes version of background on these agencies to help you 
uh, get the information that you need to craft a competitive proposal that you can then balance with your research. So the real key at the center of a successful grant application is convincing that funder that your project is something that they can give money to and is going to forward their mission and mandate. And I'll talk about some specific strategies to do that. While it's true that the federal funders, which operate with public taxpayer dollars, are obligated to take in any application that deals with the general fields that they put forward, it is also true that these agencies are tasked with advancing research and advancing inquiry in their specific areas and that they have particular priorities in doing so. The image on this slide shows the moment in 1965 when President Lyndon Johnson signed the National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities Act, which was the moment when the NEH and the NEA were established. Let's start with the NEH. The National Endowment for the Humanities, or NEH, is an independent federal agency that was founded in 1965. The mission of the NEH is to promote excellence in the humanities. That's the top line thing that you want to keep in mind when you're crafting any application to the agency. To forward this mission, it largely, though not exclusively, awards competitive grants through national peer-reviewed programs. NEH grants typically go to cultural institutions, such as museums, archives, libraries, colleges, universities, public television, and radio stations, as well as to individual scholars. The word cloud on this slide is drawn from NEH's founding legislation, which specified the areas that the agency should support. I would point out the predominance of history. You can see it's one of the largest words in the word cloud since it appears multiple times in the language. NEH still states on its website, for example, that because democracy demands wisdom, NEH is focused on conveying the lessons of history to all Americans. What I always tell people when I'm talking about the agency, however, is that the NEH doesn't only support history. So it's important to think, if you're not a historian, don't think that you can't come to the NEH. There is an emphasis on history, but the humanities, as we know, include many more fields. And in fact, the legislation that created the agency set forth specific disciplines that the agency focuses on, including the interpretation of languages and linguistics, literature, history, jurisprudence, philosophy, archaeology, comparative religion, ethics, social sciences with humanistic content, and the history, theory, and criticism of the arts. Now, while these don't necessarily correspond directly to many department names or current disciplines in the humanities, it's important to think about whether or not you heard your what you think of as your discipline, home discipline there. Um, you can fit your research into those categories. The definitions are thought to be expansive and they're not adhered to um, with a fine tooth comb by the current agency. NEH awards go to any of the subjects that are taught in the liberal arts and in many of the arts disciplines, as well as all types of cultural heritage institutions that are found in the modern research university. Let me say a little bit about NEH organization and why it matters. I've heard from people in the past that they don't want to have the ins and outs of the structure of an agency explained to them in great detail. Um, and I realize that on first glance, it may seem like a little bit of administrative minutia. However, the way that the money is doled out through an agency tells us a lot about its priorities. And knowing what the different areas of grants are also really helps to shape your application and understanding what the priorities are for the type of funding that you're applying. So let's take a look at the pie chart, which shows the amount of money that the NEH gave out in the fiscal year 2017 in millions of dollars. If you're looking here at the left, you'll see challenge grants and federal state partnerships occupy almost half of the agency's funding. I'm not going to focus on those today because they focus largely on partnerships with states in block grants, essentially like block grants, and also brick and mortar construction projects. I want you to focus on the right side of the chart and where you'll see the five divisions of NEH that give out money that supports research activities. You'll notice that one of these is called research at the top, 
it gives out a, about 13% of the funds that the NEH awards. This is uh, things like the NEH Research Fellowships, which I'll talk about later, summer stipends, and other awards to individual scholars. However, I want to stress that the other four areas on this slide also support projects which involve scholarly research. And because you can see that quite a lot of the funding goes to these areas, I want to encourage anyone who's doing work in the humanities that might fit into one of these categories, consider how their projects could be fit into one of these categories, because you can see there's quite a lot of the pie that goes to these other areas as well. For example, preservation and access is actually the largest of the programmatic areas where grants are being given out. It supports grants that go to cultural uh, collections, uh, often held in museums, libraries, and archives. But every single award that the Preservation and Access Division gives has a team of scholars that are working on it. And it must include at least one or two humanities researchers who are contributing either uh, authoritative background research or interpretive understanding of the collection and how it can be used better in the humanities. So if you work with collections or have any, any um, type of research agenda that might involve collections, you might want to consider looking at grants in this area. If you work with digital tools, the digital humanities grants are uh, something else to look at. You'll see that it is really the smallest part of the pie, but it has one of the biggest buzz around it um, and has supported many different digital projects as well as the creation of new tools. The final two sections are the Public Programs Division, which supports the integration of humanities scholarship into media programs like television documentaries or things that might be streamed online these days. Uh, radio programs, podcasts, and even things like video games. Things that will enable getting humanities perspectives into the mainstream, into broad audiences. And the education division supports the integration of humanities scholarship into the development of new curricula at both the K-12 and college levels. I will discuss later uh, how each of each of these areas uh, parses things out, um, but there are distinctive processes and procedures and programs that each one of these areas runs. And so um, I will give some more details about some of these later on, but if you're thinking about applying to any of these areas, it's important to understand how each of them works. Let's turn for a moment to the National Endowment for the Arts. This agency is also created in 1965. And it supports expressive culture through competitive grants to organizations and state level organizations. In the NEA's words, the NEA gives Americans the opportunity to participate in the arts, exercise their imaginations, and develop their creative capacities. Note that NEA only narrowly supports in a direct way the creation of new art, particularly in the creative writing disciplines. Largely, the funding of the current NEA goes toward increasing arts appreciation. As NEA states, it supports arts learning that affirms and celebrates America's rich and diverse cultural heritage and extends artworks to promote equal access to the arts in every community across the United States. Of particular note to any NEA applicant, the agency's legislation stipulates that applications shall be judged upon artistic merit and artistic excellence. So those are the two broad rubrics that any application to the NEA for funding needs to address. I'll talk a little more specifically later how you can do this through one of their programs. At present, the NEA awards most of its project funds through three major programs. Arts project grants support individual projects like installations, exhibitions, festivals, and other types of work in the arts. That's the agency's largest program and gives the most funding. The second category is the Our Town grants. These support projects that enhance or articulate the importance of the arts to particular places and communities, what the agency calls creative placemaking. And the third category are arts research grants, which typically research the impact or value of the arts in American life. The NEA releases a five-year agenda which articulates priorities in this research category, and if that's something that you're interested in, it's important to become aware of that research agenda.
The NEA's organization is a little bit less regularized across programs than is the NEH's. However, in its principal program, Arts Projects, which awards most project grants from the NEA, review of applications is managed according to artis artistic disciplines or sectors, as you can see here. They're listed on the left column of this slide. These include things like dance, design, folk and traditional arts, literature, media arts, music, theater, and visual arts. Keep in mind that these are the areas in which you must articulate the artistic merit and by which that is determined and reviewed and evaluated by the agency. And it's also the areas by which reviewers are recruited to read applications. So it's critical that an application not only address the broad priorities of the grant program, but that it situate itself within one of these disciplines specifically. This image also foregrounds uh, another one of the NEH's pri NEA's priorities, which is to think about how the arts intersect with other sectors in society, whether that be agriculture, science, medicine, technology, or um, whatever. So they're very interested in funding projects that can help us better understand why the arts are important and how they impact our life. Let me say a little bit more about the review process and how applications to both of these funders are evaluated. I'm going to talk about this in a general level, and then we'll specifically look at how that plays out in specific grant programs. At a general level, uh, keep in mind that some applications might follow slightly divergent processes, but in general, there are four main steps to the review process for any application for funding that comes into the NEH or the NEA. There's an in initial step where applications come into the agency and they receive an initial eligibility check from program staff. You don't want your application to be kicked out at this point because these you don't want to be kicked out on a technicality. So this is a point where your work with the research administration and research development uh, folks here at the university can be really helpful in ensuring that you are absolutely eligible for any program that you're going to apply to. The second step, which I'll focus on mostly, is a peer review panel. And this is also where there are some key differences between the agencies. For most applications to the arts endowment, um, they are reviewed by panels that reflect diversity in geography, race and ethnicity, and artistry. In addition to that, each panel includes a knowledgeable layperson in the agency's words. So remember that you will not necessarily be speaking to artists or creators who are working directly within that disciplinary space or that discipline, you may in fact be talking to someone who is essentially an informed person on the street. So you want to be sure that your application will speak at a broad level to that audience. At the NEH, panels are likewise constituted with an eye toward geographic and disciplinary diversity. Panelists are chosen according to topical themes of projects that are represented in the application pool. And so, although they are evaluated by peers, keep in mind that they are not necessarily read by disciplinary experts alone. Again, keep in mind for your applications that you will be want to, want to be writing at, for a generally informed audience, not necessarily specialists in a particular era of history. Neither, and a third point I'll make about this peer review process is that neither agency maintains standing panels. That means that should you apply in one year and not be funded and want to apply in the next round of the competition, your application won't necessarily be read by the same people. That means that it's important to think about what feedback you get in a particular review is perhaps just an artifact of that particular constellation of reviewers versus what are also maybe critical flaws or things that you need to address to come back to the agency and improve the application on a subsequent round.
The third and fourth steps in the review are much more kind of out of our control. The point of the grantsmanship step is to make sure that you can craft an eligible application and fit it as well as possible into the um, conversation in this sort of peer review step. Following that step, all the applications at both of these agencies are um, brought to the National Council, which is a committee of presidentially appointed positions. They typically serve around six years, sometimes longer, so they don't change with each administration. Um, and they receive recommendations from the staff who summarize the peer review steps uh, in, this, in this process, and then will uh, make recommendations based on that. In many cases, they will validate the staff's recommendations based on the peer review panel. In some cases, they may ask other questions and make a different recommendation. And the final step is by the chairperson. The chairperson of each endowment is a presidential appointee, and so they reflect the sort of administrative priorities that are reigning at the time that the application is reviewed. So the chairperson is vested by the law with the authority to make a decision on what is funded, and they will take uh, into account all of the advice given in the previous three steps and then make a decision. In many cases, this means that they validate the council's recommendation, which validates the staff's recommendation, which is a summary of the peer review. In some cases, based on certain priorities, they may make a different recommendation. So there's a lot of unknowns that might happen in these third and fourth steps, um, which are a little bit more out of our control, but um, we know much better the kinds of audience that we're speaking to in the peer review panel. The final point I will make is that you can know who is on the National Council and who the chairperson of each endowment is. That's information you can get off their website if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about the kinds of people who will be reading applications at this step. And that's the final reason that I would say make sure that you can speak to a broad audience because at any of these steps people might ask, I want to see the application or I have certain questions about why a certain project is important. And you want to make sure that they're not sort of confused or turned off by some sort of specialist knowledge that's required to understand the application. Our webinar series included an entire installment on preparing and writing applications, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but consider that you are going to be writing for a different purpose than for scholarly publication. Um, the notes to this slide, which you can access if you go to the short link on the lower left corner, include a number of specific pointers about how to make sure that you're focusing on uh, sort of grant-friendly, reviewer-centric, um, broad audience-friendly language and structure of your application. And so I would refer everybody there. My overall uh, takeaway for the sort of writing section is that you want to make your prose engaging, direct, and appealing as possible. Um, you're going to have to work it in the language of RuPaul, but remember that you're doing this in basically 11 point font on a page with one inch margins, um, and probably in five to ten pages or so. So it's a challenge, but you can do it. And a last point I would make about the review process. You may, um, you know, we all want everybody to take a lot of time to understand and digest the, min the, the minute points and nuances of our writing. However, remember that a review panel and each reviewer will consider many applications. The National Endowment for the Arts says that its panels review 40 or more applications at one time. NEH panels may review 20, 30, or 40 or more. So even if they are spending an entire day on the review, uh, your application is not going to get a lot of time. So you need to make your points right away, consistently show how your project serves the mission and goals of a specific funding program, and to foreground the key ideas and activities that make your project important. Consider using bullet points, using underlined text, uh, images, anything to draw attention to where your application and project address key agency mission, program priorities, and um, anything else that helps the reviewers see really clearly and quickly the importance of your application. Every proposal must answer specific questions so that a funder may evaluate it. 
although these may be called different things by different funders in different programs and structured variously, the questions are generally the same across different funding opportunities. What are you going to do? Why is it important to do it? How are you going to do it? Who will do it? Where will they do it? When will they do it? What will they do it with and the facilities and resources that you have at your disposal? And of course, how much does it cost? The core of these questions is what you want to do and why it is important, and being able to structure that and present it within the framework presented by the funder. I'm going to discuss these broadly under the label of significance, these important questions. And to put it more directly, your proposal must establish its significance of the project so that the funder can see how it advances their mandate. And I'm going to discuss this in terms of the review process and how to argue for this significance within three specific programs at the NEH and the NEA. Let's take a look at the NEH Research Fellowships. These fellowships are awarded to individuals. They can support up to a one-year term of work and may award a maximum of up to $60,000. The typical product of these awards has been a single authored book, but they can also support work to create a digital project, a publication, article, or translation. They are the bread and butter of individual research or humanities grants. They are very difficult to get. Typically, NEH receives more than a thousand applications every year and awards around 80 fellowships, meaning that about 7% are funded annually. Applications tend to be quite similar to book proposals and should include a clear statement of what the intended research product in, say it's a book, what is the book about? A detailed outline of the product structure, say a chapter outline, and a timeline for when it will be completed. Keep in mind that you needn't complete the book within the one year of the fellowship term, but you need to have a convincing plan for when you will complete the book so that reviewers will have a good answer to the question of the likelihood that it will be completed. The bullet points on this slide are directly from NEH program officers. And I'd like to spend a particular amount of time focused on the first one, which is about how applications are sorted when they come to the agency. Now remember that first step in the panel review is the staff uh, review. The questions they answer are about eligibility, but after that, they're starting to prepare for the second step, which is the peer review. And the peer review is going to be grouped into different groups of applications. So all those 1,000 plus applications that come in are going to be sorted into groups of 30 or so panel uh, uh, applications each. The process of sorting the applications is done by the staff, and the primary thing that they look at is what discipline the applicant has selected as their home discipline. So it's very critical to think carefully about what discipline you select. You have a chance to select two disciplines and you want to choose the first one as the one that you think is most critical, the home audience for your project. Let's say again, it's a book. So uh, you want to pick your discipline. You don't want to be too specific, say they have all sorts of different flavors of history. Uh, they might not have as many applications on women's history as they have on, say, 19th century history, or maybe they have civil war history, or maybe they have military history. So you want to, this is a good chance if you have a time to contact a program officer in advance to talk to the staff about where your proposal might fit and be most likely to receive a good reading. You can also choose a secondary discipline, which is good in case they can't quite fit your application into a pile easily. They might go past the primary and look at the secondary discipline selected. You select the discipline on what is essentially the cover sheet to the application. It's a standard form called SF-424 that accompanies all federal grants. And so it's easy to kind of go past that, but make sure you're very careful and be strategic about which disciplines you select, because that's, gonna so that's going to shape where your application goes and who reads it. Generally, the staff makes piles of 30 to 40 applications. In non-COVID times, they print these out and make physical piles. And um, resort and resort by the primary and secondary disciplines until they have more or less equal numbers of applications in each group. Once these piles and groups and panels are established, they go looking for panelists. They look for people who are going to give 
a very sensitive reading of all the applications in the group. But remember, they're, they want experts, but they want people who can evaluate all the applications in the group, so they may not have expertise in every one. They look for a diversity of panelists, including uh, experience with NEH. So each panel is going to have at least one person who has probably received an NEH award and probably an NEH fellowship on it. Panels read about 40 applications, 30 to 40 applications each. Uh, each panel includes about four to five readers or reviewers. And this final point is also important to keep in mind. Although they are reading many applications, they're only likely to discuss the top rated 50%. So if there's 40 applications, they're probably only going to discuss 20 in detail. All of the applications will get written comments, but it may not uh, be receiving really detailed discussion. So ideally, you want to position your application so that it's going to be in that discussion group. Um, if you get comments back and they all seem good and you're wondering sort of what the comments reflect, one of the things you can ask a program officer when you um, receive the comments, if you're not receiving the award, is was my proposal discussed by the panel or was it not in that top 50% group, which can give you an idea of where you sat in the group. So that's a good sort of post bad news uh, reception thing that you can do. But again, this all gives you an idea of what the process is going to look like once your application arrives. As far as putting together your proposal and making it the most strategic as possible, think about what the evaluation criteria are for the grant. It's important to write to the NEH mission, which is promoting excellence in the humanities. However, these are the ways that every panelist is asked to evaluate the proposal. Every pan review panel is tasked to read these. The staff review them at the beginning of each review panel meeting and, are, and they tell the panelists to evaluate each application according to these criteria. So there's no secret in terms of what questions people are going to be asking about the proposals. There's only a subjectivity involved in the evaluation of how well you meet these. Note here that the first two points really touch on what we've described as significance already, the intellectual significance of the project and the quality or conception of the project. Note also that point two includes the applicant's clarity of expression. So if you're not writing in a, in a plain language style and someone doesn't really have the time to get deep into it or maybe just doesn't understand the sorts of uh, nuances of your corner of the discipline, one of the things that they can say is that they don't understand or it wasn't clear to them what the proposal was trying to do. And that can be a point that detracts in this point of evaluation. Note the feasibility and appropriateness of the proposed plan of work. You wanna make sure in these fellowship applications that you lay out how and when you will complete every step of the proposed project, probably a book. And in the last two steps, they're looking at, or last two criteria, they're looking at the quality of the applicant as an interpreter of the humanities and the likelihood of completion. So for criteria four, they're going to be looking at things like your previous publication record. They're also going to be looking very closely at the letters of support that are written by two outside um, people who you get to choose. So it's very important for you to choose people who are going to have the strongest letters of recommendation to support your project. It's also really important for you to manage these people actively. You submit the application, they will each have to submit their letter of recommendation separately through the NEH's system. So you need to make sure that they've submitted those by the deadline as well. Note that the deadline for submitting the letters of recommendation is not the same as the proposal deadline. And finally, the likelihood of completion, again, will key off of the publication record that you have, especially if you're looking at a um, publication grant. So you want to demonstrate that you know what you're doing, you've done this before, and you can complete this project too. Just a few more tips to establish significance. 
You want to situate your work effectively and emphasize the novelty of the contribution. Um, this is done through a very brief section that is essentially a literature review. And you can also pay particular attention to the bibliography. You're not going to have time to do a, an entire in-depth literature review for uh, within the space of the proposal. So one way that you can demonstrate additionally is that I'm aware of the literature and making sure that you establish that by including key works. Not every work, but key works that show that you're aware of the shape of the field. This also helps to identify connections to other areas. The staff uh, in presentations at conferences will also tell you to avoid hype. This means generally avoid jargon or particularly discipline specific or um, or area specific terminology. Often things like IZE, like problematize, anything that's going to kind of not create clarity but make things more complicated. So avoid the hype. Also they will suggest to you to avoid uh, over-reliance on gap filling. The key here is the next bullet point which is demonstrate rather than assert. So don't just say we know a lot about the Civil War but there's this gap. Show that through a couple of paragraphs that really explain why we don't know about it. In general, the broader your language is, the better, but you also need to explore the specific uh, contributions that your project is going to make. And finally, again, as I mentioned previously, actively manage your letter writers. I want to move on now to a second category of grants at the NEH, which is the Preservation and Access Grants. These grants support a variety of things, and I'm going to focus on the ones that look at digitizing collections, creating digital collections, and creating uh, infrastructure for the humanities, by which I mean things like reference resources such as dictionaries and encyclopedias. Every one of the projects that NEH gets requires the participation of humanities researchers, scholars, and specialists in order to help to interpret the collections. These grants generally focus on collections. The way that that's done is by including humanists on the review panels and evaluating the way that humanities expertise and perspectives are integrated into the proposal. So let's talk a little bit about the panels. Preservation and access panels include subject matter experts who will evaluate that humanities piece. They will also include technical experts, people like metadata specialists if you're working with a digital collection, digital preservationists who can evaluate your plans to make the collection remain accessible over time, or if you're dealing with physical collections, conservators and collections managers. In some cases, their panels also include institutional administrators who can speak to whether or not the proposal is going to fit within the structure of a collecting institution's uh, plan of work and whether it's going to be maintained over time. So I mentioned these last two categories because you want to make sure that your language, again, is intelligible and makes sense to them, not just to the humanities experts reading the panel, reading the proposal. As with research panels, reviewers, uh, four to five reviewers will read each application. However, they're generally reading fewer applications in this division, of often 10 to 20, sometimes more. Applications in this uh, category are typically sorted by subject emphasis or methods. So think broad humanities themes, things like American history, music and performing arts, history of science. They're broad categories. So, you know, again, if you're thinking about just, say, history of the Civil War collection, you're not going to be grouped with only collections or proposals that are dealing with that. You'll probably be grouped with things about American history generally. In other cases and programs, applications might be sorted by institution type. Say it's a museum collection, a library or archival collection. Or in some of their programs, all applications are reviewed by a single panel. One thing that you can do when you are preparing an application is ask the program sp staff specifically how are applications sorted in this program and how do you think my application, my project, would be grouped with. This will help you kind of situate and argue for the significance of the project that you're doing. A couple more significant or specific steps to establish significance for the preservation and access grants. 
rather than describing a broad thematic area or a specific area of research, which you would do in the fellowships, you'll need to make a, a very detailed yet concise description of the materials or collection that you are going to be dealing with. Things like what are the materials that it's made of? What are the processes to digitize it? How many items are there and how big is it? You'll also need to explain the relationship to the humanities. You can do this through the literature review, which kind of will allow you to mention other scholarship about the collection or about the themes that the collection addresses. And you'll also want to pull out potential that for the collection to support further research, teaching, and programming in the humanities. Here, think about those other areas that NEH supports and why this collection might help anyone working in those other areas as well about the specific collection, you want to talk about usage of the materials. How many times have people come and asked to consult the materials if it's a closed collection? How many reference requests have they received? These are things that the collection managers and specialists who you should be com collaborating with will be able to answer. Also, how many previous publications were created using sources from the collection? Has it been used in exhibits or other digital projects? Or is there the potential to do any of these things? And finally, are there related collections out there? So, for example, at Michigan, we have the Clements Library, which has many collections on American history. You'll also find other collections around the country or locally, say the Newberry Library, that have complementary collections. So talk about those collections and what's unique and important about the collection you're, ta you're, you're working with and want to do more scholarship with. And finally, you can talk about ways that should your project be completed, this, how will this expand or strengthen current resources? What other things will it allow scholars to do or questions that they can ask once this is made digital or once this is made better available? The third and final program that we'll discuss is the National Endowment for the Arts Arts Projects Grant Program. These are the most numerous of NEA's awards. If you're familiar with NEA, you may have heard artworks in the past. That program is now called Arts Projects. Arts Projects Awards are a minimum of $10,000, and you can request up to $100,000, but the average awards are between twenty dollars and $30,000. The grants require a one-to-one -one cost share, which means that each dollar you receive from the agency must be matched by one of yours. So, uh, effectively, a grant from the NEA cannot cover more than 50% of the project costs. Generally, projects in this category can last from 6 to 24 months, so up to two years. All applications to this program are reviewed by panels, which include at least one layperson. Applications are submitted according to artistic discipline, which I discussed previously, as artistic sectors. Although the program has two deadlines annually, not every discipline or sector is open at each deadline. So if you're engaging, say, in media arts, you'll want to check to see when media arts is accepting applications. NEA evaluates applications according to two broad rubrics, artistic merit and artistic excellence. So in your strategies for presenting significance in any application to this program, consider these two factors most highly. In the excellence category, pay special attention to project personnel and the organization that you're working with. You can think about past work, past exhibitions, or recognition that the artist or organization has received. You can think about how long the organization has been established. These are way of, ways of talking about the record of excellence of the applicant. Barring other factors, a history of success and activity carries weight in demonstrating that you have done this in the past and will be able to do it again. Under the artistic merit criterion, attention is paid to the way that you describe the importance of the project to the intended audience, the appropriateness of the resources mentioned to carry out the project, and also to broader factors such as the ways in which a project might celebrate American creativity initiate and advance respectful dialogue or community healing or enrich humanity. Many projects are also evaluated according to the ways in which they can reach underserved communities, communities that haven't been reached by these types of programs in the past, or how the project can strengthen the arts. 
Remember that it's important to demonstrate how your activities uh, will do these things in your project, not to merely assert that they will do that. As we're wrapping up, I want to just spend a moment to talk about what happens when you get a response. It's only writing the application and submitting it is complicated, but it's only the first step on a fairly long journey. You may wait six to 10 months to get an, a response from the agency that you've applied to. And given the funding disparities and ratios of awarded projects that I mentioned previously, it's common for researchers in the humanities and arts, as well as many of areas of the social sciences to not receive the award, award the first time you apply. This can be difficult news to receive, but I want to suggest some ways that you can try to take that news and turn it around and use it to your advantage. It's always good to use all of the work that you've done preparing an application again if you can. What are some specific areas and ways in which you might practice resilience? First of all, when you receive news from the agency, take a moment. I would say this whether you receive good news or the bad news. Phone a friend, vent to your partner, talk to your colleagues. Don't share your immediate reaction with the funder unless they call you on the phone. Hopefully they will send the news to you in an email or a letter. Take a day or two to process if you receive a rejection or as much time as you need. I, as a program officer, I have been on the receiving end of angry emails when people receive the news and I understand that response. However, it's not a good way to build relationships with the funder. And if you are thinking about applying again, whether with the same project or a different project in this program or another program, you want to think about establishing and strengthening the relationship with the program staff, especially if you want this to be funded. Next, once, whether, again, whether or not you're funded, ask for the comments. All of these agencies that we've discussed in this presentation get comments from reviewers. They're written and they can share them with you. It is always useful to see what the reviewers said, even if the same reviewers aren't going to read a resubmission. Read the comments to inform your ideas about how and whether to revise the proposal and whether or not to resubmit it. In the arts and humanities, be ready to feel like you don't get a very specific reason. Remember that funding is scarce, so this is part of the reason that that can happen. And there is often no better reason that you're not funded than that there just wasn't enough money available in that year. But even in those cases, all is not lost. Think about ways in which framing the proposal more convincingly within the funder's frameworks or evaluation criteria could change things. You can ask program officers when you receive this news whether or not there's any way that they would suggest to make the application shine or rise to the top a little bit more, to rise to attention beyond the other applications. When you read through the application comments, develop a series of authentic questions that you can take back to the program officer. I've hinted at many of these along the way through discussing these previous programs, but there are some other things that you might think about. You can ask them about other ways in which your project might fit their program guidelines, whether or not they're aware of other programs at this agency or other agencies that might be a better fit for your project. Ask what would happen if you reapply and whether or not you should mention that you've applied previously. In some cases that can help you, in some cases it will not. And you can ask them whether it's good to discuss in detail the changes that you make. Finally, if you're not funded, think about how this has allowed you to develop your research. At the very least with NEH applications, you're gonna get a panel of four to five, a, a docket of four to five insightful, hopefully, comments about your project. This reflects ways that you can develop it further. And also think about the ways that the work that you put into the proposal uh, took your project to a new level. And hopefully you can either bring it to another funder, another program, another round of the uh, award cycle, and take that into the next phase of your work. As we're wrapping up, I do want to point out that there are many other funders out there in the federal sector. Some of them are listed here, organizations like the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, and the Institute for Museum and Library Services. 
If you visit this slide using the short link at the bottom left, I've included a link, a list of other funding areas and specific opportunities at funders with links so you can follow them and learn more about their funding opportunities. I would also love to hear about other funding opportunities that you're interested in across the humanities and so if you have them please send them to me by email or suggest them in a comment. Some final strategies, as much as possible, leverage your direct contacts in the field to get an understanding for what's happening. And they may have a sense of what programs are out there and what other programs you might apply to. And also think about the researchers resources here at the university. One of those is the Pivot database, which is a resource that you can log into. It's a paid database, but as a member of the U of M community, you can log into it. It's something that the university pays for. You can set up a profile and tell it more about your interests. The more information that it has about you, the more detailed it can be in its grant search results. It's a way to get a better idea of the breadth of funding opportunities that might be out there that could fit your interests. Additionally, you can set up a weekly reminder or a list of grants that it finds that it will send to you by email. It's a great way to kind of keep your thoughts going as you're thinking about funding opportunities. And finally, be sure to utilize all of the research, re research development staff and opportunities and resources here at the university, whether that's talking to staff like me, to other staff in your uh, local units. You can reach out to us. You can see the services that we offer at the research development page, which is linked here. On that note, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, you won't be able to submit questions to this recording, but should you have them, you can reach Jill Jividen, the Director of Research Development, at email by email by the address here, or you can reach me by my email address there. You'll also be able to see these slides at the short link at the lower left or to follow this Dropbox link to see the transcript and um, download the PowerPoint of these slides. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that these slides have helped you learn something new about specific federal funders, that they've helped you learn about some of the processes and ways to strategize about shaping your project so that it can be as competitive as possible. Thanks.